Hey everyone, Tyler here. So today I will be discussing the use of microtransactions in video games and their contributions toward the pay-to-win phenomenon in video game culture today. More specifically, I will be looking at Electronic Arts, also known as EA, the recent history surrounding microtransactions, the backlash from customers in this strategy, and we'll discuss the reasons behind FIFA's success in the utilization of the pay-to-win model. So what exactly are microtransactions? Well, during the first two decades of the video game industry, the dominant model of earning for video game publishers was the sale of a full game, which basically means that users were obliged to pay in order to play the game, also known as the pay-to-play concept. In the past 10 years, publishers have developed a new approach, which, instead of selling entire game content at once, they tend to decompose the sale into several smaller transactions. The prices of these supplements are often calculated in the virtual currency that is considered to be the currency of the video game and not in one of convertible currencies, which creates additional confusion. These are microtransactions. Now there are many different types of microtransactions out there in the gaming industry. For the purpose of this video, I will be discussing those that favor the pay-to-win gaming model. These types of microtransactions are those which bring certain advantages to the user, thus changing the existing balance in the game. In single-player games, these purchases facilitate the game in the terms that the player starts with improved initial performances. In multiplayer games, they bring privileged position to a player who pays or discriminate the players who do not pay. Another option is buying improvements for character or fraction that player leads in multiplayer games, which disrupts the existing balance in the game to a lesser or greater extent. In practice, this means that players who pay microtransactions have more chances to win under the same conditions than the players who do not pay. Games which by means of in-game purchases create an extreme imbalance of power are usually called pay-to-win games. These have historically been in the form of loot crates in action games or card packs in sports games. Now, where have we seen pay-to-win microtransactions utilized in EA gameplay? Well, first we will take a look at a more recent EA game that failed extensively due to its obvious pay-to-win structure, Star Wars Battlefront 2. In these reviews, it is obvious that customers were outraged by the amount of pay-to-win structure that was put into the Star Wars Battlefront 2 video game. The amount of pay-to-win made it obvious that the company was trying to encourage microtransactions from their customers, enabling them to make a quick dollar. So even though there has been so much backlash on EA's utilization of the pay-to-win model, we are still reaping the benefits of microtransactions. In fact, microtransactions, DLC, and live services are such a massive revenue stream for EA that they announced that in 2017 alone, the company pulled in a whopping $1.68 billion via digital content outside of full game downloads. That is an insane amount of money for a model that so many people are up against. How do they achieve so much success if everybody is so far against the idea of the pay to win model? Well, simple answer is FIFA. According to Forbes magazine in 2016, the FIFA franchise accounted for nearly 40% of Electronic Arts' revenue. The company sold close to 15.5 million units of FIFA, with each unit itself earning nearly $121. This figure comes not only from the initial game sales, but also from services such as in-game purchases and the ultimate team feature, FIFA franchise. As stated in the previous quote by Forbes, the game mode that utilizes the pay to win model is called FIFA Ultimate Team. Ultimate Team is a multiplayer game mode that allows players to build their own team and face off against other players. The way to obtain players is through a loot box that FIFA players refer to as FIFA Packs. These packs can be earned by accumulating enough FIFA coins through games, or by winning certain amounts of online games, completing challenges, or by winning online tournaments. However, these methods get you lower level packs and have less probability of earning you a higher level player. As you can see in the picture, the higher level packs are very high in price and may take a while to accumulate enough coins to purchase them. However, However you can purchase FIFA points that will allow the player to purchase many of these packs without actually having to play an extraordinary amount of games. The better players that are on a team, the easier it is to win games, plain and simple. Hence the reason that most people spend money on FIFA points to obtain the best players possible in the shortest amount of time. This is how microtransactions work in FIFA Ultimate Team and how they support the pay to win model. So my attempt in the next 5 minutes or so will be to break down the layout and ideals surrounding the FIFA franchise 
in order to better understand its successes in coercing customers to participate in its play to win structure. So first, they embed the play to win game mode, which is FIFA Ultimate Team, into a game that provides choice for all consumers. They provide a game for all interests and give everyone a choice in what type of game they would like to play. Within the game, FIFA offers a wide variety of game modes that allows you to participate in single player games, multiplayer games, head to head games, games that require PlayStation Network, games that don't require PlayStation Network, games that you can purchase microtransactions, games that you can't, and the list goes on. In total, FIFA has over 10 different unique game modes that the consumer can play, depending on their own personal decisions and preferences. This is deliberately done and was proven so through EA boss Andrew Wilson and his remarks at the EA E3 2018 media briefing. Andrew Wilson stated that as you play games this week, there are some things we hope come through. First, that at the very core is choice, is that you as players get to choose how you play, what you play, when you play, and what devices you play on. That in making those choices, you feel you are treated fairly, that no one is given an unfair advantage or disadvantage for how they choose to play. Now through these statements by Andrew Wilson, as well as through EA's deliberate structuring of the FIFA game, what this does is that it keeps the consumers quiet, unlike in their Star Wars game. In the Star Wars game, you can't avoid playing under pay-to-win conditions, so the system is more obvious and seems unfair from the company. This caused a huge backlash from consumers. In FIFA, on the other hand, consumers can play whatever game they would like, and they are choosing to play the game that is eliciting money from them. So it can't be the company's fault, right? So, there is free choice in the game modes, but why do so many customers still find a way to filter their self to the pay-to-win game mode known as FIFA Ultimate Team? Firstly, we must look at the structure of the game itself. EA decided to make their pay-to-win game mode a multiplayer game mode, which is the most popular type of game mode today. According to Nanan Tomich, the expansion of commercial use of internet and increase in data transfer speed led to the development of multiplayer game modes, so the playing in pairs or groups from home became possible. Games designed for single player have not disappeared, but the innovations led to the changes in users' preferences, which turned the market more towards multiplayer games. Publishers have noticed that the players are more willing to spend their money on these types of games than on single player games. Therefore, EA chose a game mode that would appeal to the largest group of people. Once they decided on what they wanted their game mode to look like, they had to look towards marketing. Like most popular culture products, it is marketed extensively and in a particular way to the public. Looking at the game layout and appearance, it is easy to see that it is the most marketed game mode within the FIFA game. On the home page, it takes up half of the screen itself. Then, when you move over to the play tab, you can see that it is the first square on the left hand side, as well as the biggest section, along with the brand new Champions League mode. It is pretty evident that EA wants you to enter that section of the game. So moving past the basic structural marketing, we also see extensive marketing of the game mode done through the use of YouTubers. In a study by Valiaka and Lapisto on the influence of YouTubers on consumers, they state that through inbound and influencer marketing, Companies have been using YouTubers for their marketing means with the aim of utilizing their fame and fan base. So the consumer is more likely to trust the YouTuber when they are marketing certain products rather than commercialized content, thus making YouTubers an efficient marketing tool for companies. Whether EA has paid these individuals or not has been a huge debate for years, but seems quite likely given the nature of the videos that are produced as well as the amount of in-game currency that these YouTubers have. There are thousands of people out there with FIFA YouTube videos, yet some of the most popular individuals today include Mini Minter, 2 Sync, Spencer FC, and the most popular with over 10 million subscribers, Rotu Shaw. It has come to my attention that some FIFA YouTubers are claiming to be the Pack King. And to that I say, name me the only YouTuber who has got Team of the Year Messi, Team of the Year Ronaldo, Team of the Year Suarez this year. In case you need reminding. Ugh. Walk out! Yes! Please! Be something decent! Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god! The 
process that you just saw Rotisha and Ant was the process of pack opening in FIFA Ultimate Team. Pack opening videos are the most popular FIFA videos on YouTube today and all of the top FIFA YouTubers partake in streaming the Ultimate Team game mode for most of their videos. Through the excitement that these YouTubers enact through their pack openings, they draw in customers who want to feel that joy as well. So we've talked about marketing and the structural complexities of the FIFA game, but what keeps the customer coming back? Why is it that with all of these other game modes, the most popular game mode in FIFA is still FIFA Ultimate Team? Well, there is much debate currently on the idea of loot boxes and the relation to gambling. According to Zendel and Cairns, both when gambling and when buying loot boxes, individuals stake money on the outcome of a future event whose result is determined at least partially by chance in the hopes of receiving a valuable reward. Due to the formal features that loot boxes share with other forms of gambling, they may well be acting as a gateway to problem gambling amongst gamers. Hence, the more gamers spend on loot boxes, the more severe their problem gambling becomes. This is exactly what is happening in FIFA Ultimate Team. The only difference here is that you are spending virtual currency rather than real money, even though real money was probably used to obtain the virtual currency in the first place. A sense of fake pain is invoked into the player when they receive poor cards in their packs. Not only is this because of the poor card they receive, but also in the appearance and animations of the cards as well as the pack opening itself. Let's take a look at a pack opening of a non-rare card and see how this entails. As you can see, the physical appeal of the card is very dissatisfying, and there is no animation for the card. However, when we took a, take a look at the pack opening of a very rare Wait, card... 30,000 packs left! There's, only, there's already been 30,000 of these packs bought! Oh! We get a blue! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, what? what the fuck? In this case now, it's easy to see that there is an appealing physical card, there are positive background celebrations, and there is a player animation. This invokes a sense of joy and excitement into the player and entices them to keep playing and coming back to try again. In conclusion, it is easy to see that EA Sports dangerously relies on FIFA, and more specifically the Ultimate Team game mode within FIFA for a majority of its profits. Even though an overwhelming disdain for pay-to-win style games in the video gaming community has been seen, as well as backlash of their own Star Wars game, EA has still successfully utilized the pay-to-win strategy in their Ultimate Team game mode for large profits. Through purchase of the game itself, the customer is first able to play many different game modes depending on their preference, making it seem as if it is the customer's fault that they are being coerced into playing the game mode that requires them to spend money for an advantage. This allows EA to control the backlash received by putting the blame on the customer rather than themselves. Then, the structure of the game is built to be appealing to the largest audience in its multiplayer design and is also built to promote the game mode more than any other on its navigation screens. The marketing of the game was then taken further to the vastly popular realm of YouTubers. YouTubers, containing millions of subscribers, stream videos of themselves binge spending on player packs and receiving overwhelming satisfaction in their pack openings of the best players, invoking a response in the customer. Lastly, the idea that ties it all together is the parallels to gambling. Players get an addictive rush in hoping that they will receive the best players in their purchases, and when they are successful, they begin to win more games, and this drives them to want more, and spend more. In conclusion, EA has put in a great deal of effort in ensuring their profits stay high, and they have successfully accomplished this through the use of micro microtransactions in their pay-to-win game mode FIFA Ultimate Team.